democracy would give people without money and without a TV show some voice in how they are governed. Therefore, I'm for it. You do exactly what I tell you to do or else I imprison you. Is that the freedom that you recognize? No, that's insane. Amidst the stifling shadows, Tucker Carlson's voice resounds with a dramatic revelation. Our ability to speak freely to the government is under siege. I mean, England is the birthplace of free speech, of Completely. habeas corpus, of kind of framework of liberal democracy that we thought we believed in. Yeah. And now it's a country where people are arrested for praying. If I tell you that a man has been unjustly arrested for armed robbery, that is not, strictly speaking, a lie. He may have been framed. At this point, there's been no trial, so no one can really say. But if I don't mention the fact that the same man has been arrested for the same six times before, am I really informing you? No, I'm not. I'm misleading you. And that's what the news media are doing in every story that matters, every day of the week, every week of the year. A country without free speech is not a democracy. Free speech is a prerequisite to democracy. You can't have it without it. You can't have a dinner party without dinner. You can't have a democracy without free speech, period. There's a saying that I heard, and I don't know who said it, but he said that a sick country adopts laws like a man will try medicine. And I think that the UK is failing in real time. At the most basic level, the news you consume is a lie, a lie of the stealthiest and most insidious kind. Facts have been withheld on purpose, along with proportion and perspective. You are being manipulated. There are clergy in who are being thrown in prison. Convents raided, nuns kicked out, Priests handcuffed, thrown in jail. So, I mean, on one level you think, well, it's not my country. You know, they do all kinds of barbaric things around the world. You can't be upset about all of them. Much more interested in what's happening in El Paso than I am in Kiev. With unwavering conviction, he dives into the heart of the matter, daring to expose the erosion of our once cherished freedom of speech. If you look at it in any metric, whether it's living standards, whether it's great, any, any metric you can measure the success of a country by, it's fallen off the cliff. It's becoming more and more expensive to live there. The education system's gone down the pan. London is the stabbing capital of the world. You're not safe to leave your house. So their answer to this is just more and more and more laws. And unfortunately, as they do that, they're not even intelligent enough to actually attack the people who are doing genuinely bad to the world. They just make more and more authoritarian laws and they end up using them to attack the people that the government doesn't like. And I ended up being one of them. We never, not only do we not have that conversation, that conversation was literally banned. Now it's in the guidelines of most of the big social media companies, you can't have that conversation. So I would just, I would make a couple of points. And the most obvious one is, any country that doesn't allow a free discussion of the process by which its leaders are elected is not a democracy, by definition. Once I realized what was scary to me is, I, I said this to my brother, I said, once the parliament's discussing you, you're basically considered a national security threat at this point. You're a threat to national security at that level. And then all bets are off, right? If you, what, what about the UK? What, so the UK has become more authoritarian than anywhere in the Persian Gulf. Correct. How did that happen? Yeah, um, and, and it's, like I said, it's very interesting because people still, the people on Camp B who don't think, a lot of them believe that the law is fair. I've had people say to me, oh yeah, what they're doing to you is garbage. Well, you need a lawyer. So well, yeah, I do need a lawyer and I do have a lawyer. Thank you. But it's not that simple, unfortunately. You know, it's a very, the law is very subjective. And uh, if they want to attack you with it, they're going to do a very good job of attacking you with it. And, and, and that's what the UK does. The UK have these laws which are extremely subjective and they can use it as a weapon to basically silence anyone they decide. Through the lens of his impassioned commentary, Carlson becomes an impassioned advocate, urging us to fiercely protect this cornerstone of democracy. The other thing you notice when you take a little time off is how unbelievably stupid most of the debates you see on television are. They're completely irrelevant. They mean nothing. In five years, we won't even remember that we had them. Trust me as someone who's participated. 
You often hear people say the news is full of lies, but most of the time that's not exactly right. Much of what you see on television or read the New York Times is in fact true in the literal sense. It could pass one of the media's own fact checks. Lawyers would be willing to sign off on it. In fact, they may have, but that doesn't make it true. It's not true. And yet at the same time, and this is the amazing thing, the undeniably big topics, the ones that will define our future, get virtually no discussion at all. War, civil liberties, emerging science, demographic change, corporate power, natural resources. When was the last time you heard a legitimate debate about any of those issues? It's been a long time. Debates like that are not permitted in American media. Both political parties and their donors have reached consensus on what benefits them, and they actively collude to shut down any conversation about it. Suddenly, the United States looks very much like a one-party state. That's a depressing realization, but it's not permanent. Our current orthodoxies won't last. Nobody actually believes them. Hardly anyone's life is improved by them. This moment is too inherently ridiculous to continue, and so it won't. The people in charge know this. That's why they're hysterical and aggressive. They're afraid. They've given up persuasion. They're resorting to force. But it won't work. When honest people say what's true, calmly and without embarrassment, they become powerful. At the same time, the liars who've been trying to silence them shrink and they become weaker. That's the iron law of the universe. True things prevail. Where can you still find Americans saying true things? There aren't many places left, but there are some, and that's enough. As long as you can hear the words, there is hope. In the shadows of governmental restrictions, he stands as a vigilant sentinel of our rights, reminding us of the power we risk losing. So I asked a self-appointed Christian leader about that, and I said, what do you think as someone who spent his life advocating for religious freedom about raiding nunneries and throwing priests in jail. And he said with a straight face, well, they, you know, they had the wrong views. Amazingly, as of tonight, there aren't many platforms left that allow free speech. The last big one remaining in the world, the only one, is Twitter, where we are now. Twitter has long served as the place where our national conversation incubates and develops. Twitter is not a partisan site. Everybody's allowed here, and we think that's a good thing. And yet, for the most part, the news that you see analyzed on Twitter comes from media organizations that are themselves thinly disguised propaganda outlets. You see it on cable news, you talk about it on Twitter. The result may feel like a debate, but actually the gatekeepers are still in charge. We think that's a bad system. We know exactly how it works, and we're sick of it. Starting soon, we'll be bringing a new version of the show we've been doing for the last six and a half years to Twitter. We bring some other things too, which we'll tell you about. But for now, we're just grateful to be here. Free speech is the main right that you have. Without it, you have no others. And by the way, isn't it, it's so interesting and narcissists are this way, the projection involved. It's like whatever it is they're doing, and I mean at a precise level, is exactly what they accuse you of doing. You're attacking democracy. Really, I like democracy. Democracy would give people without money and without a TV show, some voice in how they are governed. Therefore, I'm for it. And they want exactly the opposite. So the middle class in America, which has been not the majority since 2015, an anniversary that nobody noticed, has less economic power than it's ever had. That's why Trump got elected, in my view. And now it has less political power than it's ever had. So if you are taking power away from large segments of your population, you are by definition attacking democracy. That's exactly what you're doing. There's no other name for it. So that's the first thing I noticed. In the name of defending democracy, we took away the things we need to have democracy, which is our core freedoms guaranteed in the Bill of Rights, just as in our war for democracy, we are supporting a government, paying for the entire government that has banned opposition parties, put opposition leaders in jail, shutting down free speech, now shutting down an election, and putting dissident priests in prison. It's such a democracy, they don't have elections anymore. 
That's how pure a democracy it is. But the second thing, and what's I think more applicable to this conversation, I learned, is that their response was the tell. If you want to know what they care about, if you want to know what's important, listen to how they respond when you say something unapproved about it. His unwavering convictions serve as a clarion call, rallying citizens to resist any encroachments on the freedom to speak our minds. What's it like to work in a system like that? After more than 30 years in the middle of it, we could tell you stories. The best you can hope for in the news business at this point is the freedom to tell the fullest truth that you can. But there are always limits. And you know that if you bump up against those limits often enough, you will be fired for it. That's not a guess. It's guaranteed. Every person who works in English language media understands that. The rule of what you can't say defines everything. It's filthy, really, and it's utterly corrupting. You can't have a free society if people aren't allowed to say what they think is true. Speech is the fundamental prerequisite for democracy. That's why it's enshrined in the first of our constitutional amendments. So you have religious freedom or freedom of speech or freedom of assembly as long as you stay within the lines. But if you express an unapproved view, then you go to jail. But that's freedom, isn't it? You do exactly what I tell you to do or else I imprison you. Is that the freedom that you recognize? No, that's insane. And so that irritated me. And I said, well, but don't you think as a Christian leader, you should say something when Christian clergy are imprisoned for their views? No. And how dare you say that? And this person was joined by a chorus of people on the right. Yeah, shut up. Shut up. National Review wrote a piece this morning. Shut up. It's bigoted to notice that Christian clergy are being imprisoned. And my view would be, you know, maybe you care, maybe you don't. But if you're a Christian leader and Christians are going to jail for their views, you are required to say something. And if you don't, you're not much of a Christian leader. And by the way, the person I was speaking to is a person I think of real faith and of decency. Like I would let him babysit my kids. Not for long, but for dinner. I mean, I don't think he's like an evil person. He's not a secret in Long Island or something that I know of. But he with a straight face told me this. And he said, but what he really needs, and I say this as a Christian leader, is more cluster bombs. And I thought, well, you know who it was. And I thought to myself, more cluster bombs. Now, I am not a Bible scholar. But I'm pretty sure, having read four out of four Gospels, that like Luke 17 doesn't call for shower cluster bombs on the children. In fact, I'm just going to go out on a limb as a non-theologian and say the overriding message of the New Testament is bring peace. As the dramatic battle for unfettered expression unfolds, Carlson's resonating voice remains a guiding light, reminding us all that the power to challenge and question our government is the essence of a robust democracy. So don't be like Ashley Babbitt's mother, much less like poor Ashley Babbitt. That's the message a wannabe dictator would send. And by the way, it's not just public protest that would be banned in a dictatorship. You wouldn't be allowed to complain from your own home. Unauthorized opinions expressed on the internet would be censored. Go too far, press too deep, tell too much truth, and they'll just erase your opinions. They have no choice, really. It's a matter, as they say, of trust and safety. You must trust the leader or else you will jeopardize his safety. Not that you really can jeopardize his safety at this point. The leader has nuclear weapons and you don't. He'll remind you of that from time to time. And in any case, you're in the process of being disarmed anyway, along with everyone else who has shown questionable loyalty to the leader. Those who support the regime can keep their weapons and use them freely, including on public transportation. That's a core civil right for them. But for those who dissent from the program, self-defense is an unaffordable privilege. Turn in your Mr. and Mrs. Peaceful Opposition. You're a danger to society, and we know who you are. And in fact, the wannabe dictator does know who they are because he knows everything. Technology has made him all-seeing. A report in Wired magazine just this week revealed that the highly non-dictatorial Biden administration is busy tracking the phones of millions of Americans without their knowledge and without bothering to get a warrant. And at the same time, the same non-dictatorial administration 
is stockpiling a massive trove of damaging information about these same Americans, to be used at some point, we are sure, for entirely noble purposes. So the administration now knows everything, where you spend your days, who you talk to, what you think, your habits. Not a big deal. Hunter Biden, who broke federal gun laws, can still carry a gun. Hunter Biden was selling prints of his art, and to be clear, just the prints, not the quote, art itself. Like a relentless investigator, Tucker Carlson delves deep into the labyrinth of Hunter Biden's misdeeds, unearthing a trove of revelations that shake the foundations of trust and raise unsettling questions about the abuse of power. This spring, word began to circulate in Washington that the House Oversight Committee, under its new chairman, Congressman Jamie Comer, had discovered behavior after reviewing thousands of pages of the Biden family's bank records. In his piercing words, Tucker Carlson delivers a wake-up call to a nation gripped by uncertainty, reminding us that the Hunter Biden case is not merely a political sideshow, but a concerning saga with far-reaching implications for the soul of our democracy. So the FBI has had physical possession of Hunter Biden's laptop for more than three years. Now, on that laptop is indisputable evidence of fair violation, gun felony, influence peddling. And Hunter Biden, of course, has not been charged by federal authorities. He has not been raided either because he didn't pray in an abortion clinic. The specter of corruption looms large, casting a dark shadow over Hunter Biden's dealings as Tucker Carlson's relentless pursuit of truth forces us to confront uncomfortable realities and demand accountability. Now, publicly, to the extent they responded at all, the White House dismissed the investigation as, of course, politically motivated. In any case, irrelevant. Hunter Biden was an adult, so his business dealings had nothing at all to do with his father, in this case, the president of the United States. But in private, everybody understood it wasn't quite that simple. With every damning piece of evidence, Tucker Carlson paints a vivid picture of a scandal that transcends partisan lines, exposing a nexus of power, influence, and potential wrongdoing that threatens to erode the very pillars of our society. There has long been overwhelming evidence that Joe and Hunter Biden's financial lives are not separate at all, but deeply intertwined. On Hunter Biden's laptop, there's a suggestion that the two of them, even at one point, shared a bank account. And of course, Hunter Biden wrote himself that he kicked back cash from his foreign business deals to his father. He wrote that bitterly. The Hunter Biden case becomes a symbol of a broken system as Tucker Carlson's impassioned words resonate with a nation yearning for transparency, justice and a restoration of faith in our institutions. The weight of Tucker Carlson's concerns echoes through the airwaves, a clarion call for truth seekers and patriots alike. But virtually everyone who tried to investigate the contents of that laptop has been under attack from DOJ. For part two of our new documentary, Biden Inc., we looked into the Biden administration's efforts to crush this story. As he refuses to let the Hunter Biden case be swept under the rug, ensuring that the dark underbelly of corruption is exposed to the light of day. So the answer is in fact in the question. Whatever Hunter Biden goes down for, and we know he is gonna be charged because MSNBC said so, but when that happens, that's Hunter's problem. It's got nothing to do with Joe Biden. Rest easy, America. But in the background, I knew, and I knew people who worked with him in his business, that he was effectively selling access to his dad. Yeah. And I'll just be totally honest about it. I did never really thought about it because I lived in D.C. for 35 years where people sell access to government officials. They're called lobbyists. And that's kind of the business of the city. And I never really thought, wow, that's kind of though. I knew and I didn't know the extent of it, of course. But I remember someone who had worked with him saying to me, wow, he's getting really, really close to, you know, what you should not be doing because it's. And it turns out, based on what we know now from the laptop, that it was absolutely that his, and the reason we made this documentary was not to inform you that he was doing something wrong. Everyone knows that. It was to take a long form piece and explain it and show on the screen exactly how we know this. It's not a partisan attack. It's not a president's son. This guy shared a bank account with his dad while his dad was the vice president. His dad was bringing him on trips, including to China. He was doing business with the people he met on those government trips and kicking back the money to his dad. That's not an allegation that is shown on the laptop, which is why they suppressed it. Five days later, the Oversight Committee released its findings, and they were, in fact, devastating. Quote, bank records show the Biden family, their business associates, and their companies, their many companies, received over $10 million from foreign nationals and their related companies, the committee wrote. 
Investigators had, quote, identified payments to Biden family members from foreign companies while Joe Biden served as vice president and after he left public office. So actually, there was something there. It was a scandal. Racketeering, money laundering, wire fraud, those are some of the the Biden seemed to have committed, in addition, of course, to selling out the United States for cash. So what would happen to them? Well, Donald Trump had an idea, quote, they'll hit Hunter with something small to make their strike on me look fair. Trump wrote that about two weeks ago, and it turned out those were prescient words. This morning, Hunter Biden pleaded guilty to pretty much nothing. Biden pled to two misdemeanor tax evasion charges, then entered a diversion on a federal gun charge. That's it. As far as Merrick Garland's Justice Department is concerned, Hunter Biden is done. There was no pre-dawn raid carried live simultaneously on CNN. There was no perp walk, no handcuffs, no press conference. Above all, there was no felony. Hunter Biden, who broke federal gun laws, can still carry a gun. It's like it all never happened. In fact, the Justice Department just baptized Hunter Biden. A lifetime of sins washed away in an instant. It was a secular miracle. Most miraculous of all, Hunter Biden somehow escaped a FARA charge. FARA is the Foreign Agent Registration Act, and it is exactly what its name suggests. Under federal law, if you are acting as an agent of a foreign nation in Washington, you are required to register with our government to let everybody know. Well, for decades, pretty much nobody in Washington did register under FARA, and precisely no one was ever prosecuted for it. No one. By the way, Hunter Biden's whole life has been a monument to that message. Despite a decades-long drug problem and no record of legitimate achievement of any kind, Hunter Biden has managed to accumulate the highest possible academic credentials. Georgetown and Yale Law. Don't try that at home. As well as what appears to be millions and millions and millions of dollars. How did he do that? You couldn't do it, but then you're not Joe Biden's son, and that's how he did it. He cut business deals with corrupt countries that his father was conducting diplomacy in as vice president of the United States. And then we know from evidence that he apparently planned to kick back some of that money to his father as part of the deal, 10% for the big guy. Now that's completely illegal. And yet neither Hunter Biden nor his father, Joe Biden, have ever been indicted for doing that. Instead, and here's the best part, the real we learned yesterday are the people who dared to talk about it. Yesterday, Hunter Biden's legal team released a letter demanding that Joe Biden's friends imprison anyone who criticizes Joe Biden's son. So these letters call on the Department of Justice, which Joe Biden controls, and Delaware Attorney General Kathy Jennings from Joe Biden's state. A more interesting question, though, which is another question the feds will never consider, is what does Hunter Biden do for a living now? This is a man with no obvious job and, of course, zero skills. He spent midlife smoking crack. Yet somehow he's managed to live pretty well despite rising inflation. He's been living in big houses in the costliest residential neighborhoods in the world. He's been paying his stripper baby mama 20 grand a month in child support. And he has retained a team of the most expensive lawyers in the country who spend quite a bit of time sending threatening letters to anyone who asks questions about how they're being paid. We can confirm that firsthand. So again, what does Hunter Biden do for work? That's a fair question, and tonight we have the answer. For years, Hunter Biden was an influence peddler. Now, Hunter Biden is a self-actualizer. He self-actualizes for a living. He gets in touch with himself, his feelings, and he follows his muse. Private companies arguably have a right to do with it what they want with information. The government may not, under the Bill of Rights, in the First Amendment to the Bill of Rights, may not censor information, political information in particular. And that's exactly what you had here. We have seen evidence, proof of the fact that the FBI and then the Biden campaign and now the Biden administration pressured social media companies, Twitter in this case, to withhold relevant facts from the public on the basis of which people might cast their votes. So that's not an attack on democracy. I don't know how we're defining attack on democracy. You can't have a democracy without the free flow of information. If I don't know the facts about the candidates, I can't vote for them in an informed way. I can't have a democracy. And they prevented the rest of us from knowing things. They did it in secret. And once again, they did it illegally in contravention of the First Amendment. It could not be clearer. 
What's the goal of this? Your refuge. There's no goal, he says, grinning with those fake teeth. It just keeps me sane. But actually, there was a goal. And if you didn't know what a virtuous person Hunter Biden was, you might think it looked a lot like money laundering. Two years after that interview, Hunter Biden was selling prints of his art. And to be clear, just the prints, not the quote, art itself, but effectively photocopies of it for $75,000 a pop. Apparently, Hunter Biden moved five of these repros in just days. That's $375,000 in less than a week for signing copies of your fake art. As for the paintings themselves, childish self-indulgent blots, those sold for half a million dollars a piece. So the question is who bought them and why? It'd be interesting to know. There's a story there for sure, but of course we have no right to know. There's no public policy implication. It's not like Hunter Biden's finances have anything to do with his father's finances. Meanwhile, once his father did become president, corporate publisher Simon & Schuster lined up as well to pay Hunter Biden's bills. According to news reports, Simon & Schuster gave Hunter Biden millions of dollars for his highly selective account of his wholly unaccomplished life. And then the publisher lined up brainless celebrity endorsers like Dave Eggers and Stephen King to promote it. King, who apparently will say anything if it helps the party, called Hunter Biden's silly manuscript a, quote, harrowing and compulsively readable memoir. And then Stephen King described Hunter Biden himself as beautiful. We know this comes from the Kremlin, Adam Schiff said. And of course, Adam Schiff would know since he, unlike you, had access to top secret information. You weren't allowed to see it. He did see it. And on the basis of that knowledge told you it was from the Kremlin. And it's exactly what dozens of former Intel officials told you. They saw the evidence and this was from Russia. So now it looks like they were all lying. According to Hunter Biden's lawyers, quote, Mr. McIsaac unlawfully shared Mr. Biden's property with third parties. His property, he owned it, it was his. Yes, the laptop, according to Hunter Biden's lawyers, belonged to Hunter Biden, did not come from the Kremlin, that's settled. Except wait, no, it's not settled. Because today we got yet another statement from Hunter Biden's lawyers, and they seem to revise the first statement. Here's today's statement, and we're quoting. These letters do not confirm McIsaac's or others' versions of a so-called laptop They address their conduct of seeking, manipulating, and disseminating what they allege to be Mr. Biden's personal data wherever they claim to have gotten it. (laughs) So in other words, we believe the government should send these people to jail for possessing stolen property that belonged to Hunter Biden, but that so-called property may not actually exist and may not even belong to Hunter Biden. That's their argument. It's a novel legal theory, actually. In fact, it's so novel, it's totally incoherent. It's like prosecuting somebody for stealing your imaginary car. But even if we can agree that the laptop is real and not a deep fake produced by some diabolical Russian AI program, and again, neither Hunter Biden nor his lawyers have conceded that yet, maybe they will tomorrow. But even if we could all agree on that, there is another more fundamental problem. And it's this, Hunter Biden signed an agreement acknowledging that if he left his device at John Paul McIsaac's repair shop in Delaware for more than 90 days, if he didn't pick it up, he would forfeit ownership of it. Needless to say, the book sold miserably, but Hunter Biden got to keep the millions, and that was the point, and so on. This kind of thing apparently happened a lot. Again, there seems to be a story here, and we think it's probably worth learning a lot more about it and bringing it to you. In the coming weeks, we will. In the meantime, though, the question is, what can we learn from Hunter Biden's plea deal today? First off, the obvious. For the children of the people in charge, there are no penalties. There are only upsides. They're princelings. They can do what they want. You are not. Therefore, you can't. So don't get any ideas about cheating on your taxes or violating federal gun laws unless you want to celebrate next year's Father's Day through the glass in the visitor's room. The rules definitely apply to you including rules you don't yet know exist. But there is also a deeper lesson here, a more disturbing one. What we're watching through Hunter Biden's life and through the Biden administration now entering its third year is the total inversion of virtue. What was once considered admirable is now derided as stupid, if not racist. That would include achievement, 
intelligence, honesty, self-control, humility. Those are features of the old America. Those were yesterday's virtues. They are gone. In their place, all that we once considered contemptible and repulsive, we're told to worship that now. Here's a small example, but we think a revealing one. In addition to his many other sins, Joe Biden has hired what has to be the single dumbest, nastiest, most dishonest, most ridiculous person he could possibly find for the very public position of White House press secretary. There's a point to it, of course. It was a humiliation exercise. It was designed to degrade the country and dispirit the rest of us. That's the White House press secretary, shut up. But here's the thing. The White House press secretary herself has no idea why she's in the job. It's a very uncertain situation to be picked up on just before New Year's Eve and thrown in a cell without charge. If you don't have the answer to their questions and you are being tortured, you can psychologically break. Tucker Carlson's voice reverberates with dramatic intensity as he dives into the haunting narrative of the Tate brothers' imprisonment, exposing the chilling reasons that led them there. You are essentially incarcerated right now. Absolutely, I'm on house arrest, and that counts as jail. You can only be held six months without charge. I was initially picked up, thrown in a cell without charge, and I think the intention of the entire investigation at that point was to find, because they had very, very weak evidence, So I didn't realize that there are apparently women involved in your gang. Yeah, in this organized gang. So what you have to understand is this. They didn't want the case file, the evidence to be that I manipulated people by being nice to them to make TikTok videos. That's not what they wanted. They put me all over the news. They searched every house I own in the country with armed men. They were looking for victims of something. They contacted 2,000 people who know me or knew me. They tried very hard to convince some female somewhere to come forward and say something bad about me. The media machine, which works hands in hands with the justice machine, as you know very well, did exactly that. In fact, they offered bribes effectively. They'd call up ex-girlfriends and say, if you have anything bad to say about Andrew, we can pay you $50,000 for the story. And they tried very hard. Any woman to come forward and say that she was hurt by me. They were looking for real evidence. The fact that the case file is so laughable now is just because real evidence doesn't exist. So when you have no real evidence, you go for junk evidence. You try to make your case on, based on, well, they were nice to these girls on TikTok, and these are girls who would say to me, hey, share my post on Instagram. I'll be like, yeah, no problem. They charged me with whatever they had from the beginning, which is very little. And now we have to wait for the Romanian judicial system to analyze the file and God willing, throw it away. How long it, did you spend in jail? I was in jail for 92 days in a Romanian jail. With unwavering conviction, he peels back the layers of the case, daring us to confront the darkness that surrounds their actions. So, you know, because I'm a big social media guy, I don't know a single person when I had Instagram, from my cameraman to my personal trainer who didn't ask me to blow them up on Instagram. But that is now the link they have between me and these people, saying that they're, you know, these people, you know, defend me. But there are two women involved, yes. My personal assistant and her friend got thrown in prison with me. Ooh, that one. It was certainly an uh, interesting experience. Um, I won't lie and say it was easy. It was certainly very difficult. The uncertainty of it. It's a very uncertain situation to be picked up on just before New Year's Eve and thrown in a cell without charge. And I'm asking different prison guards and different prisoners, how long am I going to be here? One person was like, I've been here two years. I was like, you've been charged? She goes, yeah, but I haven't gone to court yet. Like everyone's been there for years. I thought I was going to be there for years. And it certainly takes a mental toll on you. And, and I think jail is a different experience when you know you're innocent. When I, there was a guy in there from, he's like, yeah, I'm someone I'm in jail. You can kind of, your soul and your mind yes. can accept the punishment for, but when you've actually done nothing wrong, I think jail is a lot harder. Did you know why you were there? Not initially. So for the, about the first two weeks, I never actually got told in English what I was accused of because I was arrested on December 29th. There's New Year's. What were the circumstances of that? Yeah, uh, December 29th, 5 a.m., the armed guards ran in this house. Uh, they spent all day searching the entire house. They were very interested in electronics, as most federal agencies are. And then they put me, they took me that evening and said, we're going to go and put you in jail for 24 hours. And after 24 hours, you see a judge, and the judge will decide if you stay in jail. And the judge decided I should Wait, stay in what jail. What did you do? I mean, did you make, who'd you call? I, I had a lawyer. 
And my lawyer came and he said, we need to analyze the case file. We need to see what they have against you. You're being accused of That's insane. Who? When? What? I went to jail and then I was given all this paper in Romanian. I don't speak Romanian, although I live here. And then I was waiting for the translation. So I think it's about two weeks before I finally got the papers in English to understand why I was in a jail cell. And then I really understood how insane the accusations were. Amidst the legal labyrinth, his piercing insights cast light on the complex web of motivations that culminated in their fateful decisions. Essentially, there was inviting one of the alleged victims to a birthday party that I wasn't even at that happened in this house. That's how they How long were these two women in prison? The same 92 days. The same 92 days. You know, the worst part- Have they been charged? Uh, yeah, along with us. They're part of the organized gang, which is hilarious because Luana, one of the girls, has never, ever, in the whole six years I've known her, had a conversation with Andrew once. They don't know each other. Andrew didn't even know her name. And she's apparently a part of this organized gang. Um, the interesting part is, do you remember Christopher Hitchens when he was alive? I knew him well. Oh, well, I've never met the guy, but I read an article he did for Vanity Fair about 11 or 12 years ago, where he volunteered to be waterboarded to test the effectiveness of torture on foreign prisoners. And the conclusion he came to was, in the article, and I remembered it vividly when I was in jail, if you don't have the answer to their questions and you are being tortured, you can psychologically break. You have to be torturing people who do know the answers. Otherwise, this is an ineffective mo mode of uh, operating. And essentially, the way I look at the way these two women were treated was they were locked in prison because they know us. They're an attack vector on us. One is my personal assistant, so she knows everything I do. She does airport pickups, pays my electricity bills. And every week or so, they had the keys of freedom dangled in front of them. Are you ready to tell us about the tape activities now? And they said no, and they stayed in prison. And next week, you ready to tell us about the activities that the tape brothers did? And the problem is, they can't have told the police about the activities that I take part in, because those activities don't exist. So I see it as a method of psychological torture. I'm not mad I was sent to jail. Any notions of being angry at injustice and stuff that I truly have in my soul is for those two girls who went to jail with me because they didn't deserve it. Through the lens of his impassioned storytelling, Carlson becomes a formidable storyteller, guiding us through the intricacies of a tragic tale. I like to believe that if you become the most Googled man in the world for saying that you have mental resilience, that God is gonna make sure you don't have that degree of fame without testing you. I like to believe that God comes along and says, yes, I've allowed you to become the top G. We're gonna see if you really are the top G. I believe that's how the world works. It's certainly intimidating, especially knowing you're completely innocent. The people who hate me are just loud. They're very loud, but I don't think they're very big in number because the comment section trashes them, even on their own matrix media, mass uh, um, mainstream media articles. The BBC will post an article. BBC people who subscribe to that page and like the BBC watch that video. The comment section trash them, trash them. So that's what makes me happy. It's the comment section. So keep up the comments, guys. <laughs> Why is BBC so single-minded in its attacks on you? Well, don't look at BBC, well, I mean, you know this. You can't look at BBC as a media organization. What funds the BBC? The TV licensing fee, the ta UK taxpayer. It is the government's propaganda branch. When there are big riots in London, the BBC doesn't cover them until three days later. They don't want to inspire people to go, to go down to London and protest. It's not a news organization anymore and it is a government-funded agency for telling the British people what to believe and what to think. In the shadows of society's judgment, he stands as an unyielding inquirer, urging us to unravel the reasons behind the Tate brothers' incarceration. Once I realized what was scary to me is, I, I said this to my brother, I said, once the parliament's discussing you, you're basically considered a national security threat at this point. You're a threat to national security at that level. And then all bets are off. Right? If you, what, what about the UK? What, so the UK has become more authoritarian than anywhere in the Persian Gulf. Correct. How did that happen? Yeah, um, and, and it's, like I said, it's very interesting because people still, the people on Camp B who don't think, a lot of them believe that the law is fair. I've had people say to me, oh yeah, what they're doing to you is garbage. Well, you need a lawyer. Well, yeah, I do need a lawyer and I do have a lawyer. Thank you. But it's not that simple. Unfortunately, you know, it's a very, the law is very subjective. And uh, if they want to attack you with it, they're going to do a very good job of attacking you with it. And, and, and that's what the UK does. The UK have these laws which are extremely subjective. 
and they can use it as a weapon to basically silence anyone they decide. But or why? I mean, what, the, I mean, England is the birthplace of free speech, of Completely. habeas corpus, of kind of framework of liberal democracy that we thought we believed in. Yeah. And now it's a country where people are arrested for praying. Well, we... What happened? Good question. And there's a saying that I heard, and I don't know who said it, but he said that a sick country adopts laws like a man will try medicine. And I think that the UK is failing in real time. If you look at it in any metric, whether it's living standards, whether it's great, any, any metric you can measure the success of a country by, it's fallen off the cliff. It's becoming more and more expensive to live there. The education system's gone down the pan. London is the stabbing capital of the world. You're not safe to leave your house. So their answer to this is just more and more and more laws. And unfortunately, as they do that, they're not even intelligent enough to actually attack the people who are doing genuinely bad to the world. They just make more and more authoritarian laws and they end up using them to attack the people that the government doesn't like. And I ended up being one of them. As the dramatic narrative unfolds, Carlson's resonating voice remains a guiding force. In a very loose way, they had to prove I was doing something with women by coercing them for my financial benefit, which is how we ended up with the TikTok story. Because the real evidence they wanted Maybe the prosecutors, maybe the people who attacked me genuinely thought I was a pimp. Maybe they did when they started this. And they assumed that the perp walk and putting me in handcuffs and walking me in front of the cameras would have women coming forward saying they were harmed. Maybe they were looking for real evidence. I don't believe if they knew that they were going to end up with this TikTok story, they would have initiated this attack in the first place. I really why, don't think Why do you think they did? What do you think this is actually about? I think this is about Andrew. I think this is about Andrew. And... The way to attack somebody is through his loved ones. I'm not going to say that, you know, Andrew got me put in jail. But what a way to get to Andrew than to throw his little brother in jail and say he's part of your gang. Because I don't even have any allegations of misogyny against me. I've never made a YouTube video and joked about men being better drivers. I've never done any of these things. But I had to go to jail along with him. So uh, attacking me was a way of attacking him. And attacking my pers personal assistant and her friend, I think, was a way of hoping you were going to turn these women into prosecution witnesses, essentially, to lie and say that we did. Um, yeah, it's, a, it's about Andrew and his message. That's all it's about. At the end of all of this, no matter what happens, do you plan to stay in Romania? I love Romania. I love this country. And if I am found not guilty, I will stay in Romania. Yeah, I will still stay here. I don't believe in running away. I also believe, and perhaps this is... Yeah, I didn't even want to ask you that because no, you've look, got look, a legal look. case pending, but I mean, presumably you're rich enough to run away when you have it. Correct. I'm not going anywhere. I think if I was anywhere in the Western world, this would have happened to me. I don't think this is Romania's fault. Let's put it that way. I don't think this is Romania's fault. I think if I resided in Switzerland or France or Italy, the same thing would happen. From knowing what I know, I think it was going to happen to me regardless. And I think I do have a large amount of sympathy, especially amongst the Romanian population. I'm, I get thousands of messages a day from Romanians apologizing to me. I think the people here actually like me. My waiter at lunch yesterday is one of them. He, he wanted you to know, yeah. Oh, amazing. This is what I mean. Everyone understands what's happening. My problem is not with Romania. I don't hold any personal grudges against Romania. I think that this matrix attack on, was gonna come to me. Basically. What is the matrix? Good question. I guess some Americans call it the deep state, but I like to look at it in a more global way. When I say the matrix, I think there are certain agendas which are being pushed. I think the media machine and the judicial systems of the world work together hand in hand. I think the goal is to control people's minds to a point where they don't discuss anything that's important. Reminding us that behind every legal case lies a story of human complexity, choices, and the quest for redemption. But I also feel like, I mean, throwing me in jail, the authorities here, or whoever was attacking me, certainly underestimated our relationship. They thought Andrew was going to, I don't know, say something he shouldn't to get me out of jail. They thought I might roll on him to get myself out of jail. I don't know why they thought throwing us all in jail and saying we were a gang was a good idea. But you try to find weak links in a group. And also the fact that my personal assistant, God bless her, didn't lie about us to get herself out of jail. Mine and my brother's relationship, and I want to make this very clear, inspires the other people around us to loyalty. I have such high standards of what loyalty means because I have Andrew that I expect absolutely nothing less from my friends. I mean, you've seen this house. There are men sitting around this house. They've flown across the world, 24 hours, some of them, to come sit on house arrest with me as opposed to enjoying their lives and running their businesses or seeing their kids. They're here with me. 
the loyalty we have for each other translates into every other aspect of our lives. I feel like we get more loyalty from women, we get more loyalty from friends. We, un we have a standard to measure loyalty against, and it's a standard that's 100%. So that's a beautiful thing about our lives as well. So that it works, it helps everything. How much of the media coverage of yourself and your brother do you read? Quite a lot, but I know what the articles are gonna say based on who says them, you know? And I, I've heard fans of mine raise some questions, raise some quite legitimate questions about the webcam studio I used to own. We can cover this in a minute. But I, I try to read as much of it as I can, especially when I go out of jail. Because I wanted to see where the land lays, but it's, it's the comment section that overwhelmingly tell me the consensus of people.